Good morning, morning. and welcome to worship here at Lakeside on this, uh, did anybody see any mosquitoes this morning? Wood ticks? Nothing. No, but but I give you thanks for your bravery in coming out on this this frigid morning, but we come in the new year uh, to give thanks to an awesome God who has blessed us in so many ways, and we also come with those burdens that weigh us down and trusting that Christ present here to refresh us and renew us uh, so that we may leave this place with the joy in our heart and a bounce in our step and ready to serve God in all that we do. Uh, just a couple that in the month of January uh, we are going to uh, support uh, the ELC uh, Disaster Relief Fund and so if you would like to do that uh, there's some envelopes on the table um, in the narthex. There's can. And if you are, with all the storms that have, uh, crazy storms that have been taking place in our, in our own country, uh, with the tornadoes, um, that there is a, there's a great need at this time. And so if you're able to do that uh, during the month of January, uh, we give God thanks. Otherwise, uh, at this time, I am going to ask Patty to prepare us for worship. Prelude. Thank you, Patty. Let us please stand as you are able and let us continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. 
In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. May be seated as we sing our gathering song when we are still in the season of, of Christmas. So I know everybody wants to sing all the Christmas songs before Christmas, but this is your last opportunity until, well, you can sing them anytime. Maybe we'll have a special one in the middle of summer. But it is Christmas, so let us sing with us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all. For this holy house, for all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For those who wonder uh, why we sing the Kyrie, the Kyrie eleison, it is Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Uh, let us pray. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For sharing of the peace this morning, rather than the shaking of hands, we will do uh, sign language. And so, peace is your hands like this, here, with you, be with you. So it's thumbs together, one more time. It says, peace, be with you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And uh, my prayer for today and for the rest of the year is peace to all mankind, civility to all mankind, and let's get this darn virus behind us. Our first reading today is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30, beginning 7th verse. God promises to bring Israel back to its land from the most remote parts of exile. In Zion, Israel will rejoice over God's gift of food and livestock. Young women will express their joy in dancing. God will give gladness instead of sorrow. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, 
Together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come, and with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd of flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Two weeks ago, uh, Bill kind of had a, a cheer going during the uh, passing of the peace, back and forth. And apparently uh, tonight there's a little football scrimmage between two local football teams. So uh, we will start with verse 12 with the Vikings. And verse 13 respond will then be with, in bold with the, the Packers. <laughs> verse 12. Worship the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. The strength and the powers of your gates. The blessed children of you has established peace on your borders and it satisfies you with the finest wheat. God sent us a word that runs very quickly. God gives snow like wool, scattering frost like ashes. God scatters hail like crumbs. Who can stand against God's cold? The Lord sends forth the word and melts them. The winds blow and the waters flow. God declares the word to Jacob, statues and judgments to Israel. The Lord has not done so to any nation. They do not know God's judgment. Hallelujah. Looked like a tie to me. Okay. Our second reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning at the third verse. In Jesus, all of God's plans and purposes have been made known as heaven and earth are united in Christ. Through Jesus, we have been chosen as God's children and have been promised eternal salvation. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. of eternal life 
The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John begins his gospel with this prologue, a hymn to the word through whom all things were created. This word became flesh and brought grace and truth to the world. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light. But he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And the law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart and who has made God known. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward. Well, come on. So you were asking this morning, Miss Lila, what we were going to do for the children's sermon today. And I said that we were going to talk about light. And so, as we think about... Are you scared of the dark at all? No, you're not? Yeah. I, I'm scared of the dark. Now, when it used to be when... We had, a, we had cows, we had a, and it was really dark when I'd come out of the house. It was probably like 30 yards to the barn, but when it was nighttime and it was really dark, I always thought something was going to get me before I could get to the barn. And so I would run as fast as I could, because it is sort of scary when it's, especially like if we're out in the woods and it's dark. So, one of the things that we have is, we have flashlights, don't we? Yeah, that's a... Look at that baby, that, look how heavy that is. Boy, you could do some damage with that. And then, we have, look at these. Little ones, just push the button on the end. Pretty bright, aren't they? And you know what John, the gospel writer, you know what he said? When he talks about Jesus, he talked about Jesus being what? the light of the world. And we think about the sun, right? Without the sun, it would be a lot colder than it would today. We couldn't, we couldn't be here. There would be no life if we didn't have the sun because the sun is what allows life to take place upon the earth. And we also believe, as those of us who trust Jesus, that is Jesus who gives us abundant life here on this earth. That Jesus is 
the light of the world. And so, I was going to have three flashlights so that you could take that with you, okay? But maybe Levi keychain with a deer horn on it. Good for you, huh? Yeah. And you take those with you, and if you're in the dark and you get scared, you can turn that on. And also, it reminds you, right? Reminds you, think about Jesus is the light of the world. In some ways, we're many light. Because when we let our heart shine and we do good things for others, you know what we are doing? God's work. We are doing God's work when we, well, maybe somebody falls down on the playground, right? And rather going over and stepping on their fingers, huh? we help them up. You go, are you okay? Yeah. Maybe somebody sitting at school, maybe somebody new comes to school, doesn't have any friends, doesn't know anybody. What do you think maybe we should do? Over, yeah, go sit by him, go, hey, how are you doing? What's your name? Yeah, where did you live before you came here? Welcome and say, hey, would you like to come meet some of my friends? Wonderful thing to do. It's the little things in life. So we're like, Jesus, so let us pray after me. Good morning, Lord. Thank you for this new day. Cold temperatures, warm hearts. Thank you for the gift of life and help us to be a light to shine in the darkness. This day and every day, we thank you for our homes, our family, our friends, this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, have a great day. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. It is certainly not the first time in my uh, 20 some years of ministry that I have uh, used this example at uh, the children's sermon. Because one of the things is that when we baptize here in uh, this branch of the Lutheran Church, that we light a candle. And when we light that candle, even to the babies, we say, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give thanks to God in heaven. That in some way, we are light. And when we think about light, you know, that uh, there, there's no doubt that I sometimes, you know, I don't like the dark. And it only takes sometimes just a, a little light where you just you feel better. And, and I've told this story that I, the one in time where I really think about light, I was lost in the fog out on the lake ice fishing. Right? And I'll never forget. I mean, we walked, my brother-in-law, my, my nephew, and it was early ice. There was water on top of the ice, so it looked like you're walking in open water. But we tied a rope onto my nephew, we put him out front. Sacrificed the little one, we said. <laughs> Actually, it was we could get him out and if he, because we didn't know. But I'll never forget when I seen just the glimmer of light on the shoreline. And knowing that some three hours we had walked, finally, we were going to be safe. And I remember falling down on my knees and giving thanks. So there's certainly, when we think about that image of Jesus as the light of the world. And then I was preparing. I was preparing for this message today. And I came across the story that maybe some of you have heard before. But I'm going to read it for you today because it sort of changed my perception that, you know, maybe we're, we're not many lights. Maybe we're not many lights, because there is only one light. But maybe we're something else, and let me read. Let me read for you.
this is what I came across. And it's titled, it's uh, from the book by Robert Fulgham, who I've never heard of before. Uh, and it's the book titled, It Was on Fire When I Lay Down on It. And it's, What is the Meaning of Life? And this is the story about Alexander Papaderos. Are there any questions? An offer that comes to the end of college lectures and long meetings, said when an audience is not only overdosed with information, but when there is no time left anyhow. At times like that, if you do have questions, like can we leave now, and what are we doing at this meeting, and where can I go get a drink? The gesture is supposed to indicate openness on the part of the speaker, I suppose. But in fact, you do ask a question, both the speaker and the audience will give you drop-dead looks. And some fool, some earnest idiot always ask, and the speaker always answers by repeating most of what he had already said. But if there is a little time left, and there is a little silence in response to the invitation, I usually ask the most important question of all. What is the meaning of life? You never know. Somebody might have an answer. And I'd really hate to miss it because I was too socially inhibited to ask. But when I ask, it usually is taken a kind and absurdist move. People laugh and nod and gather up their stuff, and the meeting is dismissed on that ridiculous note. Once and only once, I asked that question and got a serious answer. One that is with me still. First, I must tell you where this happened, because the place has a power of its own. In Greece, again, near the village of Gonia, on a rocky bay on the island of Crete, sits a Greek Orthodox monastery. Alongside it, on land donated by the monastery, is an institute dedicated to human understanding and peace, and especially to reproachment between Germans and Cretans, an improbable task given the bitter residue of wartime. This site is important because it overlooks the small airstrip at Malim, where Nazi paratroopers invaded Crete and were attacked by peasants wielding kitchen knives and hay size. The retribution was terrible. The population of whole villages were lined up and shot for assaulting Hitler's finest troops. And high above the institute is a cemetery with a single cross marking the mass grave of Cretan partisans. And across the bay on yet another hill is the regimented burial ground of the Nazi paratroopers. The memorials are so placed that all might see and never forget. Hate was the only weapon the Cretans had at the end. And it was a weapon many vowed they would never give up. Never. Ever. Against this heavy curtain of history, in this place where the stone of hatred is hard and thick, the existence of an institute devoted to healing the wounds of war is a fragile paradox. How has it come to be? The answer is one man, Alexander Papaderos. A doctor of philosophy, a teacher, a politician, resident of Athens, but a son of this soil. At war's end, he came to believe that the Germans and the Cretans had much to give to one another, much to learn from one another. They had an example to set. For if they could forgive each other and construct a creative relationship, then any people could. To make a lovely story short, Papadera succeeded. The Institute became a reality and a conference ground on the site of horror. And it was, in fact, the source of productive interaction between the two countries. Books have been written on the dreams that were realized by what the people in this place. By the time I came to the Institute for a summer session, Alexander Papadaris had become a living legend. One look at him and you saw his strength and intensity, energy, physical power, courage, intelligence, passion just radiated from his person. And to speak to him, to shake his hand, to be in the room with him when he spoke, was to experience his extra, 
extraordinary electric humanity. Few men live up to their reputation when you get close. Alexander Papadaris was an exception. At the last session, on the last morning of a two-week seminar in Greek culture, led by intellectuals and experts in their field, were recruited by Papadaris from across Greece, Papadaris rose from his chair at the back of the room and walked to the front, where he stood in the bright Greek sunlight of an open window and looked out. We followed his gaze across the bay to the Iron Cross, marking the German cemetery. He turned, and he made his ritual gesture. Are there any questions? Quiet quilted the room. These two weeks had generated enough questions for a lifetime, and for now, there was only silence. No questions? Papadaris swept the room with his eyes, and so I asked, Dr. Papadaris, what is the meaning of life? The usual laughter followed, and people stirred to go, and Papadaris held up his hand. And he stilled the room and he looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was serious. And seeing from my eyes that I was, I will answer your question. Taking out his wallet and out of his pocket, he, finished, he fished into the leather billfold and he brought out a very small round mirror, about the size of a quarter. And what he said went like this. When I was a small child during the war, we were very poor. And we lived in a remote village. And one day on the road, I found a broken piece of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. And I tried to find all the pieces and put them together. But it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching on a stone, I made it round. And I began to play with the toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into places where the sun would never shine. In deep holes and crevices and dark closets, it became a game to me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. And I kept the little mirror. As I went about growing up, I would take it out at idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. And as I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light, nor am I the source of the light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge is there. And it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose only design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places, into the hearts of people, and change some things in some people. And perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of life. And then he took the mirror, and holding it carefully, he caught the bright rays of the daylight streaming through the window, and he reflected them on my face and onto my hands on the desk. Much of what I experienced in the way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from my memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry a small round mirror still. Brothers and sisters in Christ, want to see what God looks like? Mirror. And it says, this was given to me, and it says grace matters. And what this says is, look inside, 
see an image of God's grace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we go into the new year. Yes, let our light shine. And let us be mirrors, reflect the goodness and the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the darkest place of this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. remain seated and let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our prayers this morning, we are going to begin by singing the first verse of What Child Is This? I will offer prayers and open it to you to lift up your prayers, either silently or aloud and also for those who will be worshiping at home. And then we will close by once again singing our prayer song. Good and gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather here today as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we enter into another new year. 
and we never quite know what the year will hold. But Lord, we trust that you will be with us through the joys and the laughter and also through the tears and the struggles. Lord, we continue to be weighed down by this pandemic. And Lord, we pray that this will be the year that we can put it in the rearview mirror and to return to more of a life that of normalcy that, that we had known before the pandemic came. Lord, we continue to pray for those who have been impacted by natural disasters, both here in our own country and throughout the world. Those who lost homes and for those who are they're still seeking for the wildfires in Colorado, be with them. Lord, we pray on this day for all who have to uh, be out in this weather, for our police officers and firefighters. Lord, keep them safe. Lord, we give you thanks that you continue to surround us with your love. We give you thanks for family, for our friends. We give you thanks for clean air, for clean water, for plenty of food. And Lord, help us to be generous so that all may have the basics of life. And Lord, now hear the prayers of those who have gathered here this morning. Lord, we continue to pray for Barbara. All these things, Lord, we commend them to you, trust in your grace and in your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, for our offering, there's a basket behind the baptismal font. And we give God thanks for all that we have. And Lord, help us to be generous in all that we do. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. For the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This morning we will commune. Uh, the ushers will invite you to come forward. Uh, you'll be handed a wafer, the body of Christ. You may eat, may eat the wafer, and then there will be a tray uh, with individual glasses, and you may take an individual glass and drink it, and then there are baskets for the empty cups um, on the edge. Uh, the clear is grape juice, and the red is wine. But this is the Lord's meal. All are welcome. This time I invite the union assistants to come forward.
Now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. God of abundance with his bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us sing our sending song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Go in peace, serve the Lord.